you're listening to Barbell Logic, brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching, where each week we take a systematic walk through strength training and the refining power of voluntary hardship. Welcome, everyone, to the Barbell Logic Podcast. I am Nikki Sims, joined here by Matt Reynolds, a very good friend who I travel with very often. That's true. I travel with Matt and Andrew more than I travel with my family. (laughs) That's probably true for me, too. (laughs) And that is why on the podcast episode today, we're going to talk about how to lift while you're traveling, if that's something that you want to do. And if you do want to do that, how to find gyms and what to bring for it. Yeah, travel hacks. Yes. You know what would be funny is if I just tried to think of all of your travel hacks and you try to think of all of my travel hacks because <laughs> we've traveled together so much. And at, we're at the point now where for staff, you know, we're usually at least three of us. We tend to rent an Airbnb, so we all stay in the same place. So it's actually even more visible than everybody having their own hotel room. So, yep, that's true. <laughs> We've done a lot of before we go to the airport, we're like hanging out in the parking lot in the back of our rental, all digging through our suitcases, repacking our bags, because usually we go to the gym and then we go right to the airport, which is, I think, the best. (laughs) Yeah. On a business trip, I always go to the gym immediately upon landing in the city that I'm going to. Mm -hmm. And also, it's the very last thing I do before I leave. I like to train on travel days. Yes. And why do you like to train on travel days? Well, travel is hard. Travel is hard on your body. We're usually going across at least one time zone, if not multiple time zones. And so training on a travel day is probably not the best day to try to hit PRs. But I feel so much better when I train on a travel day because everything else about travel kind of makes you feel like crap and makes you feel gross. And you're like, all I want to do is take a shower, but I can't get to a shower, (laughs) you know, and one of the things we'll do and we'll get into this is, you know, we'll go to sometimes these big Taj Mahal type gyms. And we can take a shower. (laughs) Yes. So nice. So a lot of times the last thing I'll do right before we go is like we train and then we get to shower, hit that sauna a little bit, a little cold shower, refresh, and then go to the airport. So then it's, you know, when I'm just having one of those days where it's just not that fresh feeling mat, I'm just not having a good fresh day. (laughs) Needs his head to be squeaky clean. That's right. (laughs) Yeah. it's, It's the same thing when I get to a city too. I just usually have to wake up. We usually fly out early in the morning to have the most amount of time in a space. And we do that a lot of times because we work apart from each other and it gives us an opportunity to get good work done. So if we're traveling for a seminar or a camp, we usually stay an extra day or two. And so we're trying to maximize that time. So I usually leave really early in the morning. My flight might be five in the morning. So I've gotten up super early and it just feels great after flying to train. And then it feels like there's normalcy to my day and I can kind of tackle the day once I get there. Yeah. Same thing on the way home. I go home late usually with an afternoon flight. So we'll usually train late morning or early afternoon before we leave town. Yeah, I know we've all experienced this before, but like the day or like two days after you get home from a trip and you lift, it can be pretty awful. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) So it's nice to get that workout done before you get home. It's like, you know that the next couple of days lifting when you're back at home might not be your greatest because you've been sitting on an airplane, haven't been sleeping in your bed. So if you can get ahead of that by getting a lift in while you're on the road, it can really help to not screw up your program. And that's really why people even ask this question is like, should I lift while I'm traveling? Because, you know, you're very disciplined. You don't like to miss workouts. You don't want to backslide or anything. So you wonder a lot of people like, should I go and find a gym and lift while I'm on the road? And we travel like at least once a month. So if we just didn't lift while we traveled, it would just throw a huge wrench into whatever progress we happen to make. We wouldn't train very much. Yeah. So it like really sets the tone for the trip and keeps you on schedule. Yeah. I think the first important question to answer really is, should you train when you travel? And there are two answers to that question, right? So if you're somebody who trains all the time, you're super consistent. So Harry Fafudis, one of our coaches and one of my clients, that guy literally never misses a workout. Yeah. So much so that he doesn't even want to go on vacation because he knows it'll (laughs) mess with his routine of training. And I'm like, bro, (laughs) go on vacation and then you shouldn't train. You take four or five days off. You'll be fine. He needs to take some time off. So (laughs) if that's you, if you're somebody who literally trains year round, super consistent, doesn't have those, even when, I mean, that guy, he'll, (laughs) 
he'll be like, I got the flu pretty bad, but I went ahead and got through my reps. You know, I'm like, oh, man, that's intense. (laughs) I mean, he's just really dedicated. And I'm sure we have listeners that are like that. And so if that's you, then go on vacation and go enjoy yourself. And you don't need to train. It's not that big of a deal. You really won't backslide as much as you think you will. No, not at all. The week back might feel really tough, but in the large scheme of things, it's completely okay. And this is coming from someone who is obsessed with not missing workouts and really wants all the PRs. Right. I promise you'll be okay. (laughs) So then you've got the sort of case Nikki Andrew Matt version of the business traveler who travels a lot for business. And you just have to find a place, you have to find a way to train. And I think one of the things that we'll dive into on this podcast today, I don't want to go down the rabbit hole there yet, is just we figured out how to make it enjoyable for us. Like If you have to do it all the time, then let's figure out a way to make it enjoyable so that you have something to look forward to. Look, if you travel for business, and I love to travel for business, and I love you guys, I love hanging out with you, it's fun. But like, at some point, traveling for business for everybody becomes a grind at some point, you're just like, okay, I'm ready to like just be home for a while. So to be able to find those things that you can find joy in, that I think is important. And so some of that depends on whether you're somebody who trains and really, I know for you and I both, we really like to train for other people who we've talked about that sort of spoonful of medicine training, figuring out a way to make it as enjoyable as possible is important if you train often. So I think that's important too. There's a third one, which I think is also interesting for me. When I train, when I go on vacation, I am more dedicated to training when I'm on vacation than when I am at home. Hmm. And that's because I really enjoy training. And the thing that derails my training is not because I don't want to train. It's because my life is nuts and I'm running a company and I have a busy family And sometimes life gets in the way. And on vacation, it doesn't. You know, when I go on vacation, I love going on vacation because I get to really think about the big picture stuff and the business. I get to really be sort of like 30,000 foot view CEO, Matt. And so I train. Now, when I say I train, vacation training for me is less training and more exercise. Like, I mean, it's still pretty formal, but I'm not out there trying to hit PRs or lift super heavy. I mean, I'm often training in resort gyms or whatever, but then that's the other thing. So if you're somebody who, whether you train super consistently at home or not, if you just really enjoy it, like if I drew up my perfect day, it would always include training. Yeah, totally. It wouldn't include a three hour super heavy session, but I love a quick 45 minute, 60 minute session. So I do that on vacation as well. So really those are the three kind of big areas. So, so that should answer whether you should or shouldn't. So if you're one of the two of the three that we talked through, should you train? then I think it would be fun to go through some of our travel hacks for how we do this. Yeah. Another consideration is if you're in an area where there are gyms that are easily accessible, you've got a car, like that makes it pretty simple. Sometimes you go to places where the nearest gym is like an hour away. Right. So it's helpful to look ahead of time. I know we always do this whenever we plan a trip and I do it when I'm on my own. It's like I will go to maps.com. I'll find the address for Google Maps. I'll, I go to MapQuest. <laughs> there, we go, there we go. Remember those days? Printing it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, print it out ahead of time. It's so good. <laughs> yeah. So I'll find out where we're staying and then I just do a search nearby for powerlifting because that tends to bring up the gyms that I know this is one of Matt's one rules, have chalk, yep. we'll have decent bars and we'll have good racks and weights. And if powerlifting doesn't choose anything, then you can just search for gyms so you can see how close everything is because if something's two hours away, that just might be your answer. Maybe you are not going to yes. lift while you're traveling. And I'll look every time between the airport and the place I'm staying Ooh, yeah. to see if there are either a powerlifting gym sort of between those two spots or Lifetime Fitness. And we've talked about this before. Yes. I definitely have no relationship with Lifetime Fitness. <laughs> For all I know, they're a horrendous Globo gym, but they're really nice. And they're all nice. I mean, they have like the nice bathrooms. They've got hair dryers and like Q-tips. That's right. Like mouthwash. (laughs) (laughs) It's so luxurious. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) They got dry sauna and steam sauna. And, you know, thank you, CrossFit. A lot of those Globo gyms at this point, they all have squat racks too. Like every time we go to Lifetime Fitness, they've got 15 squat racks. That's insane. Yeah. And like the 24-hour fitness I go to has illegal plates and illegal barbells. Right. Right. So that is how the world has changed through... CrossFit and then powerlifting and Olympic weightlifting strongman is just really influenced training in general, which is great. Great when you're running a barbell company for sure. It's really nice. So often those things are available. Those things we used to talk about that weren't available. It's man, it's pretty rare unless you go to that gym that I shall remain nameless. It's mostly purple. You're going to probably <laughs> find a squat rack. Yeah, very high chance. And so the chalk thing 
I just always bring liquid chalk, right? You've gone yeah. with me before. I've always got a little, I have a little travel bottle of liquid chalk. It's like three ounces. What brand is it that you like? You have a good one. I don't know. I knew you were going to ask me that. Ah. I go on Amazon and I search travel liquid chalk. <laughs> okay, there you go. And then there's the big things of liquid chalk and there's like the three ounce ones, which I think it has to be, I think to travel with liquid, it's got to be three or two and a half or less, something like that. I think under three or four. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a small bottle. It's small enough to put in your carry on and, and still be fine. So, and that liquid chalk is certainly not as good as regular chalk, but it works perfectly fine. Yep. And if you're not going to set PRs and you're just going to do kind of a routine workout and just feel good and train, it works just fine. Again, like at most places, you're probably not going to get a Lico bars or, you know, big Ohio power bars or something, but like, you'll be fine. Yeah. You know, like if I were trying to set an all time PR, then I want really nice equipment, but otherwise it's okay. The benches are usually the worst part about those experiences. Like horrible, horrible bench situations. You can deal with the racks, you can deal with the bars, you can deal with the weights, yeah. but the benches are usually about 10 inches wide, very slick vinyl and like six inches off the floor <laughs> right very low <laughs> and like so what's the most important thing to bring for a bench pressing your a7 shirt you have to we do that all the time yes we all bring the a7 shirt <laughs> so that you stick to the bench it's completely essential let's start here so i was thinking about i'd spent like 15 minutes for the podcast i was just making notes so first off I know that we are both big fans of hard shell cases for our luggage. Mm, mm -hmm. I'm a big hard shell case guy. You are too. You've got a great piece of luggage. By the way, as somebody who travels all the time, do not spend a bunch of money on a piece of luggage. Get a good piece of luggage, but not a luxury piece of luggage. Don't spend the hundreds and hundreds. Because I promise if you got a Michael Coors piece of luggage, that guy that's throwing it in the back of the airplane is going to throw yours just as hard as he throws everybody else's. And I don't <laughs> care how it's made. If you travel a lot, you're going to get new luggage every one to two years, no matter what. So 100 bucks for a piece of luggage or less, not more. That's sort of my general rule. So if you're like, what luggage do you have? It's not the way I am with like e-bags, backpacks and stuff. I've had Samsonite. I've, I mean, I've had all these different. I go to Amazon and I find the ones that are like rated the highest for a decent price. And that's what I get. When I can, I do carry on because I don't like to wait for my stuff. Yes. When you check bags because I think you pack a lot more than I do somehow lately. I probably do. Well, it's a C, I've got a CPAP and all, and my clothes are bigger. Yeah, I think it's the weather too. Like, well, whenever I travel anywhere with these guys, I know the house is going to be set to like 60 degrees. So I have to remember to bring like cold weather clothing. <laughs> In the middle of the summer. So yeah, I like hard shell for a couple of reasons. One, it keeps everything protected. If you're going to fly home with a bottle of whiskey, which occasionally I do, frequently I do, it's not going to get busted. So hard shell case with a lock. I've always got an identifying tag on it to make sure it's got my name and phone number. And if you have your belt in there, like you want that protected. It's expensive. Yes. Belt and shoes. And I was going to say, and we're a little bit different with this. In my hard shell case, I usually check. So I usually check a bag. And I know you and Andrew don't. I don't put anything in there that I have to have. That's all my normal clothes. That's my shoes. But it's not my training stuff. It's not my belt. It's not my toiletries. I can't live without my contact lenses, right? If my bag gets lost, I don't have contacts. I'm screwed. So that kind of stuff goes in the carry-on. The big hard shell case, I'm a big fan of packing cubes. Do you use packing cubes for your clothes? No, but I, I'm looking to get into that because I think that would be very useful. They're awesome. So again, I use e-bags and then I fold my clothes Marie Kondo style, which makes them nice and tight. So teeny. And they're kind of vertically standing up in the packing cubes. I can get a bunch in there. But the other thing is this. One of the things we've tried to do as well is if we stay at an Airbnb, we try to stay at an Airbnb that has a washer and dryer so I don't have to pack as many clothes. And if I stay in a hotel, this is another big travel hack that I had to get out of cheap sort of mindset. I always utilize their laundry service at a hotel because for a couple of reasons. One, I can pack less. And two, I like going home with clean clothes. I don't like going home with a suitcase full of smelly, wet, sweaty clothes. Totally. So that's a big piece. And that allows you to pack a little bit lighter if you know that you're going to have access to either a laundry service or washer and dryer. So that's sort of the big package stuff. And then I don't know that you do this yet, but here's a great tip if you travel a lot. So this is really just for the group that travels a lot for business. I have a travel toiletry bag pre-packed with all my travel toiletries. Yeah, let's start doing that too. I do not want to have to go through. So, you know, there's 14 pairs of contacts in there. There's all the travel. There's the shampoo and the soap. Yes, I use shampoo. Yes, I use conditioner. It's for the scalp, everyone. It's not just for the hair, right? Let's, we got to take care of the scalp. I thought shampoo was for the... Okay, okay. 
Well, I got a little stubble. Yeah. You got a little stubbins. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. You know, I pack all that stuff in there. You know, I've always buy Harry's razors in bulk. And so I've always got a pack of Harry's razors in there. So I don't have to do that stuff. It's just there. It makes packing so much easier when you just have like your go bag. Oh, my God. I just take the travel toiletry bag and throw it in. It's fine. It's so nice. I'm thinking about getting like staple travel outfits where it's just like, I just always have that. Yes. <laughs> I've thought about the same thing. Well, especially as we start to go to a little more uniform style at the camps and stuff. Like, I'm not going to wear a polo with a Barbell Logic logo on it. Probably not to like a Friday night dinner date. I'm really only going to wear it to the camp. <laughs> so it can probably just stay like yeah. packed up. It's fine. And you grab it and go. I do try to pack really versatile stuff that I can wear in various sort of locales and whether it's like, you know, not super formal, but maybe business casual all the way down to casual. So you're talking about like it's khaki shorts and white tennis shoes, no logo t-shirts and polos. That's what I'm wearing, right? You're not wearing the same thing being that you're a female from SoCal, but <laughs> I've noticed that you do a lot of the same stuff. Yeah. Like, you know, you've got a couple of your like Nikki Sims in your face gold pants, but for the most part, you got really versatile stuff too. Yeah. When I travel, I wear a lot of black because it's just easier. doesn't show sweat. Like <laughs> if you get a stain on it, your whole trip isn't ruined. <laughs> That's right. Anyway, back to traveling and lifting, traveling and training. <laughs> so what do you put your training gear in? I will bring another little bag. Yes. And when I am packing, I actually use that kind of like a packing cube. So I'll put other stuff in it. It's kind of like a shoe bag, right? Yeah. Or one of those like double drawstring bags. Yeah. One of those, something little. Yeah, yeah. And I'll try to have my training clothes and shoes in that bag on the way out so that when we do go train, I just have to take that bag out of my suitcase. Yes. And my belt and be ready to go from there. Because I'll often, if I don't do that, I'll end up leaving my knee sleeves in the suitcase. And it's just like... Yep. Big old hassle. So that's kind of how I use the packing cubes. Yeah. Do you have your like lifting outfit? Do you wear your lifting outfit on the plane? Well, it depends. Yeah. So I do a lot of times I've started doing that. If I'm going to literally rent a car, go from the airport to the rental car station to the gym, a lot of times I just wear what I'm going to train in to the airport. It was really funny in January when I'm in three inch shorts and a t-shirt and I'm walking through the airport and everybody's like, you're an idiot. And still probably sweaty. I'm like, it's hot <laughs> yeah. on an airplane. I'm fine. <laughs> right. I'm still, I'm still hot. So since I normally check my hard shell case, I always have my e-bags backpack that I use. And what I love about that, and of course, again, I've got six different sizes of those. So it depends on how much I'm taking. But, you know, that backpack, I can put my laptop in it. And my basic electronics, my earbuds of a Kindle, there's usually one book in there, you know, some pens and a highlighter, you know, all my chargers are in that backpack, often an external battery pack. And those are like cheap now and they yeah. charge anything. They'll charge your phone 25 times. It's ridiculous. It's amazing. <laughs> so that's really nice to have. And then I have my training stuff in there. So I have my shoes, my wrist wraps, which are often tightly packed and pushed inside one shoe. Yep. Wrist wraps, which are also tightly wound and put in the other shoe. My knee sleeves, I put in a Ziploc bag because they smell like a homeless guy. <laughs> and I push all the air out as much as I can and zip it close and put it <laughs> in there. And then I always bring my three inch, my Dominion three inch belt. I use a, both the three inch belt and the four inch belt, but I usually just travel with the three inch. And of course, my liquid chalk. Yeah, the four inches like gets tougher to pack. It's like really the belt loop is really tall. It's pretty big. Yeah. And then I put, this is probably over the top for a lot of people, but for you more competitive people, I've done it for so long. I like having an ammonia cap if I'm going to go remotely. For sure. Yeah. Heavy. So I take three or four ammonia caps. I put them in a prescription pill bottle Yep. and put that in the shoes. I can put everything in my shoes other than my knee sleeves, which are in a Ziploc bag and a belt. And all that is in my backpack. That's with you. So I carry my backpack on and it's got my electronics, my training gear, my training clothes, or if I'm wearing my training clothes, my change of outfit out of my training clothes into whatever I'm going to wear after training and my toiletries, my travel toiletries. Yeah. That way I've got one change of clothes. I've got all the basic toiletries. I've got all my basic training plus my laptop, which my entire life is in. Yeah. So that if they lose my check bags and it does happen and I've had my baggage lost, I think twice at this point, I travel a lot. Doesn't happen very often. Also remember that I'm coming from Springfield, Missouri, which means I always 99% of the time I have at least two flights it's almost never a direct flight. And that's where you get lost is in the layover. But yeah, I, you know, I'm able to pack this stuff pretty tight. You have a really good system. Like I'll admit Matt's system with the backpack is way better than mine, but I just haven't found a cute backpack. 
Right. That doesn't look like a pair of cargo shorts. So if you have any suggestions of a stylish backpack <laughs> that I can <laughs> fit all my stuff in. Well, you got to put quite a bit in it if you're putting all your, tra- you know, that's a belt and shoes. Belt and shoes take up some space. And the belt, you can do the thing where you wrap it around your backpack. That's right. And I've done that before, too. And some people, I think, have gotten held up at security. You know, they want to open your bag. They see your belt. They'll see your microplates. They'll see I yep. bring powder chalk. Sometimes they'll see that. They'll see creatine. And they'll be like, what is going on in this suitcase? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And they'll open it up and they'll find out that you're just a cool person. But yeah, it's okay if they do that. Most of my supplements like creatine and stuff, I usually put in my hard shell case which I check and you don't check, that can cause some issues. The e-bag that I normally take is actually sort of, I don't know, some sort of TSA stamp on it. It's got a zipper so you can basically, it unfolds open like you butterfly a steak. Oh, awesome. And so I can open it so they can just, and I just run it through like that. Even though I'm TSA pre-check, by the way, there's another hack. If you're not TSA pre-check. What are you doing? You know, it's not quite as good as it was. Actually, don't go get it because then it'll crowd the TSA pre-check line. <laughs> now, everybody is getting it, but it still goes quite a bit faster. And even though it may take a little, you know, longer than it used to, not having to take my shoes off, things like that. Oh, laptop out. It's incredibly worth it. And by the way, I think about that stuff, too. I'm sure you do, too. I'm mean, like, I don't wear jeans and a belt to the airport because I don't want to take a belt off. I don't need the belt making the metal detector go off. Yeah. And so I think about, I need to wear stuff that's going to let me just walk right through this thing and get through security as quick as I can and get to my gate. So and you want to have such good small airports, like I've timed it so frequently, like from my door in an Uber to my gate, 15 minutes. Yeah, right. It's amazing. Yeah, it's pretty close to the same. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we moved a little further from the airport in Springfield than where the old house is. But I mean, really, I'm about maybe 20 to 22 minutes, same sort of thing. So good. Yeah. And then there's little stuff like... You know, again, my brother and I talked about this a little bit in the time money episode, but I use points a lot. I try to fly first class with points. I don't want to spend a thousand dollars on a plane ticket, but at the same time, I don't want to be cramped, you know, between two other people that are as big as me, or at least pull the trigger on the comfort seat. And often with that, you get priority check-in, which is another thing that just makes my life easier to walk right into priority. Beautiful, right? I can't wait. It seems like curbside check-in has gone away during COVID. I used to love doing curbside. I would do that all the time. You get to curbside, be like, here's my bag. Here's $20. Make sure it gets there. Sayonara. And it always does. And it's fine. So yeah, all of those things are things I do. The other thing I do is I think about, since I often go train, I usually pre-pack. I think I've seen you do this too. Some Ziploc bags with like some protein, some dry protein, some oats, some chia seeds, some things like that. It's sort of like a pre-made protein shake without the liquid in it. I'll do that sometimes because I know that it's so hard to get good nutrition at an airport. If I have to get nutrition at an airport, they almost always have those core powers or muscle milks. I try to get the core powers because they've got real milk in it. And then Greek yogurt is almost always available. So I'll get that stuff and you can get by pretty well. But the other thing I'll do sometimes is I'll take a shaker cup, one of those shaker bottles, and I'll pre-put all the dry stuff in, the oats and the chia seeds and and stuff like that, but not the liquid. And then once I get through security, the very first thing I'll do is I'll go into one of those, you know, newsstand shops and I'll buy just the core power and I'll pour a liquid protein shake into the shaker cup and just shake it up and then just put it back in my bag. I don't need it right then. And I'll basically make overnight oats while I'm on the plane. And then when I get to my destination, I have a ready to drink meal replacement right before I go train. And so I'll do that a lot of times too. I love that. That's awesome. You can get those shaker cups and they're not very big. Yeah. I don't do protein shakes or anything anymore. So I started bringing like cucumbers when I travel, like Persian cucumbers are the smaller ones. Yes. Those are great for when you travel. I've brought hard boiled eggs sometimes and then I'll bring like a banana, but that one you have to remember that it's in your bag or it'll get smushed. (laughs) But they also have those at Starbucks. So I'll often go to Starbucks and get like the egg bites and an oatmeal, a banana. And that will keep you like you don't want to go train and just be completely depleted. You want to prepare for that as well. And then I like those little RX bars. But you also don't want to be full on junk. Equally as bad. Right. You don't want to have a breakfast burrito and a margarita. That's right. There are times for that. (laughs) That is after training. (laughs) Yeah, that's the hardest part about on the way out. Although if I fly out at 5 a.m., it's not quite as bad. If you use the points, you get the first class ticket. It's 5 a.m. And I'm like, boy. They're like, sir, would you like champagne? I can drink (laughs) champagne and Bloody Marys all the way there. But then the training session doesn't go quite as well. So I usually try to stick with the coffee and the water and the. But yeah, I mean, you can almost always get boiled eggs at an airport. You can get Greek yogurt at an airport. You can get some sort of core power muscle milk protein shakes at an airport. 
pretty good nutrition there and keeps your calories low. And stay hydrated. Yes, always. Like I bring my own water bottle and then just refill that through the gate. Like you have to really try to drink water when you're traveling because you don't realize it, but it's so hard to access water. Yes. Well, all right. And I'll tell you a little secret. I mean, in times of COVID, I'm always bringing a water bottle on a plane. So I have an excuse to pull that mask down around my chin and drink the water because <sighs> I, I'm go. like, oh, like but I'm that. drinking. <laughs> I'm, oh, I'm drinking right now. See, oh, here I am. Need another sip. Yep. Need to stay hydrated. Very <laughs> tiny sips to make sure that the wife water the entire trip so that the mask mostly stays under my chin. Don't email me. Email somebody other than me. I don't want to hear it. So I got it first. <laughs> so question about like actual training logistics. This is one of those questions that I have the answer to, but I want to hear your answer. <laughs> How would you modify one of your clients' training programs for, let's say they want to get two workouts in while they're traveling? Would you do anything differently for their program? Sure. I mean, yeah, we do this all the time. Most of my clients at this point are, I really like a four-day split. I've talked about that a lot. Most of my clients are on four-day splits, so on upper lower splits. So if they want to get two workouts in, rather than one upper day and one lower day, I'm probably going to do two full body days because I think the adaptive response is going to be better. The stress is going to be better. And so at that point, what I'm really looking to do is get those kind of three big lifts in. So it's a squat, one of the presses and a deadlift. And the other day is going to be a squat, and the other press and a deadlift. And then usually I'll try to, if they're in a strange gym, that's where I'll use maybe the last 10 to 15 minutes of the workout to say, hey, go have fun with the equipment you don't have at your home gym or in your garage. Let's have some fun with accessory stuff. So I'll give them some ideas like, okay, so you're going to have access to like a lat pull down machine or a leg extension, leg curl or leg press or something that, you know, that we wouldn't do that much, but it's, you know, and you've watched me, we go train at these crazy lifetime fitnesses. I'll go in and play around on the machines and stuff. Cause I don't get to do that normally. And it's just fun and it's different. And it makes me again, not the soreness is a good indicator of a workout, but it's obviously something so different and novel for me that makes me sore. It makes me feel like I did a bunch of stuff and it's fun. It's fun to do something different. So to me, when somebody travels, I want to accomplish the goal first and second, but not like as an afterthought, I want them to have fun and enjoy it. And that's really my key. So yeah, I still want to accomplish the stuff. But you know, the accessory becomes more of like, let's have some fun with it. What about you? Yeah, I like to know how many days they're going to go train so that I know how to spread it out. And I don't like PRs to be on the table. No, just because there are too many circumstances they can't control. So I'll usually modify it for that. Yep. And I'll often ask like, or I'll know based on the client, do they want to be spending a lot of time at the gym? Like maybe that's their alone time. They really don't want their training to go too far off the rails. Or sometimes they're just like, I'm going to have an hour twice that week. Like I need something quick. So I'll give them something that won't take a lot of rest and I'll give them some wiggle room on the weights so that they can, if they're feeling off or if they're feeling on, they've got the range to work with. Yep but they don't have to be there for two hours. Yep. Like I want it to be easy for them to get in and get out so they can like enjoy their trip or do what they have to do while they're on the road. So I like to know those two things. And then I'll take out any weird stuff, like if they're working with chains or if they're doing yes. banded stuff, if they're doing pin bunch, like yep. it has to be like just the basic lifts. Yep. Remind them to bring straps if they don't have chalk. And maybe they're just like, I'm not even going to bring a belt. Be like, okay, well, you're doing stuff pretty light. That's right. <laughs> Maybe they know they won't have access to a bench press or something so they can press only. So whatever info they can give me, I'll make it like super simplified and then just based off of how much time they want to be spending in the gym. Yeah, no, that's all really good. I've had a lot of clients too that go to a hotel and they're like, I know the hotel has a gym. Of course, we've all been to hotel gyms. They're typically no barbells at all. There's just like very... <laughs> dumbbells and a stationary bike. <laughs> yeah, very bare bones. And so what I almost always have them do is I say, as soon as you check in, before you even go to your room, walk down to the gym and take a quick 360 degree video of the gym for me and then go upstairs and send it to me. And I've already asked those questions. And often for the hotel stuff, it's like, I'd like to do something every morning before the business meetings or whatever for 40 minutes or half an hour or whatever. Okay. So then I'll design something that's not really training. It's more exercise, but it's something that makes them feel good for the day and they get out and they get to move and they're active. And they're more likely to eat better if they've done that in the morning. That's right. You're setting them up for success for the day. And so we just, you know, we put together a fun circuit. I mean, I think there are times when when that sort of idea sort of gets crapped on. And I think obviously we would rather train, we'd rather have barbells, we'd rather lift decently heavy. But there's times where that's just not feasible. 
when I take my kids to Disney or Universal, go to Orlando or something, I'm staying in a like a Disney resort or, or a Universal resort with them. There's no way to do that yet. I still go to the gym every day. There's a bunch of machines or some dumbbells in there. I'm like, I just kind of figure out what's all in there. And then I ride a little circuit for myself and I bust through the circuit. And by the end, I'm like, man, that was actually really hard. That was really like, did I get stronger? Probably not. Definitely not. Right. But like, did I get a good blood pump? Do I feel better? Did I just get to moving? Did I do a healthy habit? Yes. Right. I performed all those things. Yeah. And so, and just like you said, then it's funny how like when Rachel and I do that, we even go into something like a theme park, we then eat better at the theme park. We'll often do things when we travel. If we're traveling in a situation like that, like let's say we're going to a theme park, you go to Disney or Universal, it's a big deal to kind of be there when the gate opens. The earlier you're there, the better you can like ride good rides and stuff. Well, you can imagine what the quality of food is at places like that. Like that. Churros and ice cream and right. $19 bottles of water. <laughs> and please hear what I'm saying. For this just that week, Rachel and I will almost always intermittent fast on those weeks. Oh, yeah. We get up, we just, we go hit the gym, we're totally fine, and then we go have fun at the amusement park, and we're like, let's not eat till lunch, we're fine, you know, because there's nothing to eat but crap, and then I'm going to eat at lunch, and we're going to make the best decision I can, and I'm still going to probably try to get some sort of meat and some sort of carb, but, you know, I'm trying to stay away from mostly fried foods as much as I can, but, you know, we're going to drink beer, and that's just part of it, you know, stuff like that, so it's a way to be able to control calories for us, and be like, well, I'm just going to take off one third of my meals that day. Listen, I'm not saying that that's something that we want to follow that on a daily routine back at home, but it's one of those deals where you're like, I'm in an amusement park for 14 hours a day. Yeah. Like I'm going to make a choice to only eat five of the 14 hours that I'm there. <laughs> and it, it helps the situation dramatically when I'm not eating funnel cakes at 930 in the morning. <laughs> yeah, so, <seriously. laughs> yeah, I mean, I like all that stuff. And I think my final point would be like just expectations like if you go in and a travel gym and you have a great workout awesome but if you have a horrible workout it's okay like don't beat yourself up about it and you might have another couple horrible workouts when you get back but consider where you're coming from probably not sleeping as much drinking as much water you might have been walking around all freaking day or playing in the beach or kayaking whatever so the delayed onset effect of eating poorly and travel yep. is real. Like you'll feel it for a few days after, but it's okay. You're not in a valley. Your body is just coming back from a different kind of stressor and enjoy your trip. I think that's one of the most important things you can do is go have fun. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think what you kind of alluded to this earlier, we don't chase numbers when we travel. Mm -hmm. We're not number chasing in the weight room, right? Like we're going to get in and try to do the best work we can. But if you go in with an expectation of trying to chase a number, you're setting yourself up for failure most of the time. Yeah. But if you go in and like, I'm just doing this because I love the habit. I'm doing a good habit as part of my life. Just like putting on my clothes, tying my shoes, taking a shower, brushing my teeth. I train because it makes me feel good. Then go train and have fun and hit, you know, go do whatever you can do in the gym that you have, in the time that you have. And make it about enjoying it. I mean, most of these trips are either A, they're leisure trips or vacations that are supposed to be fun anyway. And the last thing you want to do is stress out over trying to chase numbers. Or B, it's a business trip and your mind really should be focused on business and you ought to be using exercise as a way to just sort of de-stress. Yeah. So if exercise is a way to de-stress and you chase numbers and it's stressing you out and then you got to go present to a board, that's not good either. So there's almost never a situation where I would say, go on vacation or go on a business trip and go chase a number and try to hit a PR unless you're literally traveling to go train at West side or something to compete. Right. Like, <laughs> yeah. but if you watch the guys like, listen, everybody for the Olympics, that's about to compete in the Olympics. They've been there for 10 days. Yeah. They're not traveling and training. Yeah. Such a good point. <laughs> right. Yeah. World's strongest man competitors. They'll go to Malaysia. They'll get to Malaysia two weeks ahead of time. Yeah. They got to get things normalized. Man, there's just, there's jet lag and there's, by the way, here's your jet lag tip. Try to match the schedule at home the day before, before you get on the plane. Oh. Don't match the schedule after, right? Now, occasionally you can actually play the flight game and figure out how to, you know, like we flew to Korea and then just stayed up. Korea was like the 15 hour flight. And I think they were literally like 12 hours ahead of us. And so we essentially stayed up for like 36 or 37 hours and then went to bed and we were fine. Man, if you're not careful, the jet lag will kill you. So in the U.S., it's not quite as big of a deal. And certainly it's less of a big deal to me because I'm in central time zone. So I'm never more than two time zones away. It's probably a little tougher for you when you fly east at this point and then 
Flying east doesn't usually bother me. Oh, I'm pretty good at going to bed at 9.30 Eastern I know, time. I'm amazed. You'll fly. I know, it's crazy. Every time we we'll, <laughs> we were in D.C. a few weeks ago, and it was like 8.30, and you're like, I think I'm going to bed. I'm like, it's 5.30 at night <laughs> your time. I think I fell right to sleep. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Went to bed. I love sleeping. And Nikki and Andrew and I, it's really funny. We were talking about this, too. This actually, I think, has made a huge impact. Yeah. There were times in our life when we did not focus on health when we trained. No. Right? We stay up late. Stay up late. Too much. Drink. Eat a lot of chocolate. <laughs> That's right. Eat a bunch of shit. <laughs> now, it is part of our lifestyle, but it's like almost part of something that we sort of take pride in that we have groceries delivered to the Airbnb we're going to. We pre order the groceries and they're healthy, good groceries. Like tons of fruits and vegetables. And the same stuff that we eat at home, right? So it doesn't change your diet tremendously. Yes. We go to bed at a regular hour. We drink very little. Like we still have a drink together or whatever, but we're not staying up late. We go to bed. Yeah. We compete with our sleep apps. We get up the oh, next yeah. morning. We like message each other in Slack about our sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're like, check out my sleep app score. Check this out. How'd you, how'd you do? Right. And so... <laughs> But, oh, my God. And then we train, you know, if we go on a four day trip, we train three times on a four day trip. The greatest. And <laughs> I don't remember any of those training sessions being like, man, remember that one time I hit this awesome number at that training? Like, we never do that. I think Andrew deadlifted 600 at your house. He did. But that's at my house. That's at the house of Reynolds. And that's got a yeah, little extra special. There's a superpower there. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> but not at like a lifetime fitness. We get a lifetime fitness. We have some fun. We get good training in. We hit the sauna. We have a nice little smoothie. And we're off back to the airport. So <laughs> that's the key. It's about making it enjoyable. And so yeah. and just tell your coach ahead of time so they can plan accordingly. Don't tell them the day before. Yes. Give them some notice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's amazing what you can do as a coach when you just even have a week in advance to kind of plan for the thing. Yeah. Because a lot of times what I'll do as a coach we didn't even get into this is that I will actually front load some stress going into the thing. Like, oh, okay, we're going to have a deload week coming up and vacation. Yeah, you're going to train a little bit, but you're going to have some fun. We're going to push it real hard this week, which most people actually enjoy. Or I'm going to go heavier than normal or whatever. Like we can do it because we're going to have the recovery yes. next week. You're not going to be training very hard. Some of that depends on what they're doing. You know, I've had clients that go to like a five day business conference where they're running a booth 16 hours a day. I'm not going to do that for them because then the trip itself is incredibly stressful. They'll be so tired. But yeah, if they're going to like, hey, I'm going to go lay on a beach and like, yeah. you know, drink margaritas and have fun. Like, perfect. Let's go heavy this week then and back off next week. I just said this funny thing happened with a client last month. He lives in Tokyo. He's like, I'm going to do a two week motorcycle trip through Japan, which just sounds amazing. Sounds awesome on June 14th. And I was like, cool, let's ramp you up to some PRs before you go. And so we did that. And then on the day he was supposed to be leaving, he was like, hey, what's my workout today? And I was like, uh, you're supposed to be on your vacation. He was like, oh, I told you the wrong month. <laughs> he told me <laughs> his two week trip. Oh, Lord. It was the wrong date by a whole month. So I like ramped him up to PRs. And then we had like uh. a whole nother month. It's like that moment where you and a friend are like leaving and you say bye, but then you keep walking the same direction. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but yeah, I did the same thing. You're like, oh, well, if we have this coming up, let's take what we can get before you go and that's right. Enjoy your time away from the gym for a little while. So communication. Yay. Yeah, it's a big deal. <laughs> All right. So think about how to pack. It's actually something you can think about. I don't think people think about it often enough, right? How can I pack for both efficiency and how can I do this to be able to enjoy training and think about training ahead of time? How do I look at, like, where am I going to train? Plan that. Don't wait till you get there to try to figure it out. Yeah. It's 2021. It's really easy to get on Google. Because sometimes you might need to email them about drop-ins. Like. That's right. And by the way, we found out Lifetime Fitness, again, not a commercial for Lifetime Fitness, but if you go on their <laughs> website and you find the place you want to go and you request a guest pass online before you get there, they'll send you one for free. You just get a day pass. <laughs> and then it costs nothing. And a day pass is $30 at a Lifetime Fitness if you show up at the counter, which we've only paid about 14 times before Ugh. we found out that you could just get online and get a free one. So Before anyone told us. Yeah. I assume if you were just a nomad, you could just get free Lifetime Fitness forever. You just... Oh my God. God. Keep requesting at different lifetime fitnesses. I wonder if they would ever flag you. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, that might be true. <laughs> yeah, and then just go have fun. Go enjoy it. Make it enjoyable. Even if you're a spoonful of medicine sort of person, figure out the things that you can do to train at the time of day that makes it the most enjoyable, doing the movements that makes it the most enjoyable, you know, the food before or after. Plan with your family so they don't get mad at you. That's exactly right. When they're like, I'm going to go to the gym. They're like, oh, we were supposed to do this right now. I'll be like, Oops. That's right. <laughs> That's right. So... Those are ways to hack training while you travel. We've done it a lot, about as much as anybody has. 
and love it and really enjoy training when we travel. Love the way it makes me feel. It's also amazing when we come back from these four day trips, I come back almost always invigorated. I'm a little tired, obviously, but it's not like I'm not like, which is the way I used to be. We used to be dead. Yeah. Yep. And you come back and you go, man, I've got my training in. Or you'll come back. Sometimes if you don't get your training in, I used to come back and like feel guilty. I'm like, now I'm behind. Now I'm two workouts behind. I got to figure out how to catch up this week. And so being able to train with you guys and eat well and sleep well has made all the difference in the world. And so hopefully yeah. our listeners can take some value from that. And bring your A7 shirt. Seriously, the bars out there and the benches out there are just rubbish. Yeah. Sticky back <laughs> shirts really help for sure. Yeah. Cool. Well, have fun, everybody. Yeah, it's another Barbell Logic podcast. Thanks for listening. If you got value out of this, we would love a five-star review. Say nice things about us. We'd love to hear from you. We check out those reviews every once in a while. I haven't looked at them in a couple of weeks. Now that I've said it, I'll pull them up. So, uh, you know, <laughs> tell us what you think of the podcast. And listen, we always actually do love to hear requests and critiques, like constructive criticism, right? Don't just tell me you hate me because I can't fix that. You can tell me what we got to do. Apparently, I laugh too much, which I don't feel bad about that anymore. <laughs> It's always interesting to, gosh, it's such a, podcast is hard. I don't know how many of these I've done at this point. I think I've done hundreds, 450, I think of ours, plus what, probably another hundred of other people's. Oh my God. So I'm probably at 550 or 600 podcasts at this point. So well, it's a lot of stuff to talk about. Thank you, Jesus, for giving me a platform. to. <laughs> <laughs> it's always funny. I did a couple of podcasts this past week and it's like, I just tear into it like the first 30 seconds. And it's just like, a, I don't <laughs> It's just, we get done and the host was like, man, that was a lot of information. And I'm like, hey, man, you're going to give me a soapbox. I'm ready to go. I've been waiting my whole life for this. Let's do this. You're going to give me an audience. I got some stuff to say. Let's do it. So, hey, thanks for listening. Thanks for being part of our audience. And we appreciate you. Thank you for giving us an hour of your time. Yep. And we'll see you next week. Bye.